Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, November 28th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, who is really behind Jill Stein's election recount to overthrow President-elect Donald Trump? Right on cue, in walks the usual suspects. And while you're at it, why don't you audit California and find out how many illegal aliens voted for Hillary? Then, will Donald Trump betray us by appointing General Petraeus, who will be the next Secretary of State? Plus, Ohio State University is a gun-free zone, and victims are left defenseless as a madman brutally attacks students with a machete, highlighting yet again the insanity of preventing responsible people from having access to firearms when their lives are in danger. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, looks today as if Jill Stein's quixotic quest for money and for fame may be over. But even if it is, in all reality, we'll still see the mainstream media promoting it, won't we? You know, we're going to take a look tonight at her tactic, which is basically to deny Trump a victory in the Electoral College. But we're also going to look at the long-term strategy of Soros and those who are trying to shut down the Electoral College. What does that mean? And, of course, we had good things to say about Jill Stein back in June when she was pointing out that uh, Hillary Clinton was a criminal with the email uh, scandal that was happening at the same time. At, the, at that time, we had the Libertarian Party ticket still heaping praise on Hillary Clinton. But Jill Stein, back in the middle of uh, June, had this to say. She said the investigation of Hillary Clinton's email scandal should go forward. She said this is a sort of typical Hillary Clinton to do things that are not legal, to say that they are and then try to cover them up. Yeah, and so now this criminal is the one that <laughs> Jill Stein is trying to get into office. But of course, there's much more behind that. It's really more about Jill Stein. It's about her raising money for the recounts. It's about the attention she's getting. As the Washington Examiner pointed out, Stein has raised more money for the recounts than she did for her own campaign. They said that she raised three and a half million to campaign for the White House, but she has raised six and a half million to try to pay for recounts in three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Now, the interesting thing about this is she's also getting a lot of press coverage. They say the nets are, networks are giving her 12 times the amount of coverage of her entire campaign as well as the amount of money that she's getting. Uh, Newsbusters via Drudge reported when Jill Stein was a Green Party candidate for U.S. president, the networks only gave her 30 sec 36 seconds of coverage, but now she's gotten 7 minutes and 26 seconds of coverage in just Four days from NBC. Meanwhile, she's run into some big bumps on the road to getting this done. She had a major setback today, earlier in the day, when Wisconsin, the first state that she uh, moved to have this recount done, rejected the idea that they were going to do hand counts. And, of course, hand counts would be the way that she would delay this to keep Wisconsin and these other three states from sending electors to the Electoral College. The Wisconsin Elections Commission set a timetable today, Monday, for a recount of the presidential election, but they rejected a request to require a count by hand made by Green Party candidate Jill Stein, who quickly responded that she would sue. As a matter of fact, I have her complaint here in front of me, and if you look at it, it's based on uh, essentially a couple of articles by mainstream media, by Wired, New York Times. Uh, she then... Uh, these were articles that were in August of 2016, but then she did not put in any of the articles by the same sources that said, no, don't worry, we're not really concerned about hacking. She said that hackers infiltrated the email system of the Democrat National Committee. Therefore, according to Jill Stein, they would be hacking the machines as well. And, of course, that is a clear and present danger. And we've warned people about that. We've also told people that it is a major problem that we don't have a way to monitor these electronic voting machines. and yet. Jill Stein had nothing to say about that in the lead up to the election. She was silent, just as she is now silent about voter fraud. Now she pretends to care about election fraud. Moving on with the other setback that she had today in Pennsylvania, uh, it looks like she's missed the deadline. So it looks like she may not get Pennsylvania at all. According to Wanda Murin, spokesman for the Pennsylvania Department of State, the Philadelphia Inquirer reported today that the deadline for voter-initiated recount was Monday, November 21st. And as you remember, at the beginning of the broadcast, I said today's date, Jill, 
is November the 28th. You missed it by a full week, not even close. You know, maybe when we talk about Jill Stein being the green candidate, maybe what they really mean by this is not that she's an environmentalist, but that she's so green she doesn't know what's going on. She has now become even more irrelevant in this post-election process than she was during the election process. They point out that although Trump beat Clinton in Pennsylvania, this is a feat that was not accomplished by Republicans since Ronald Reagan in 1988. And it wasn't even close, they said. 70,000 votes. That's a significant margin that will be very hard to overcome in a recount. But here's what the real strategy is. Now, this is an article from the American Thinker that aired over the weekend. She's challenging Donald Trump in three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Now, right now, Donald Trump has 306 electoral college votes based on uh, the, the states that he won. What she's trying to do is take away 10 in Wisconsin, 16 in Michigan, and 20 in Pennsylvania. That'd be 46 that she would take away. That would take him from 306 down to 260 if they were able to hold up this recount beyond December the 19th, which is when the Electoral College meets. That is the tactic that they're trying to uh, accomplish here. So that would take him below the level of 270, which he would need to win the Electoral College. The problem is, since she missed this deadline by a full week in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is now off the charts here. And now it goes back in the Donald Trump column. So even if she were successful in delaying Wisconsin and Michigan from participating in the Electoral College, Donald Trump would now have 280, which is more than he needs with the 270. And as I pointed out over the weekend, uh, when I tweeted out on this, I said, really, the purpose of this is to delegitimize the election, not just for Trump, but for the Electoral College, and to also forward Soros' uh, purpose of having a type of color revolution here. What George Soros has done over and over through the former Soviet Union states, he has started with an election that they said was not legitimate. So they first delegitimize the election. Then they portray the winner as someone who is authoritarian, and they energize the college students, saying this is an illegitimate election by an authoritarian, as we've seen them portray Donald Trump as a racist and a Nazi over and over again. That's become the irrational meme that they throw at us. So if they do that, and they do those two things, then they think that they can energize the college students, as we've seen done throughout former Soviet Union states. That is truly the long-term strategy of this. But the other part of this is to also overthrow the Electoral College. And you need to understand just how important the Electoral College is. The other thing I tweeted out over this weekend is that it is a firewall to the corruption and the concentration of power in just a few big states. Now, underlining that is what Donald Trump said in his tweets. He said, hey, if we didn't have the Electoral College, I would have campaigned differently. And this is what he said. It would have been much easier for me to win so-called popular vote than the Electoral College. He said, I would have focused on three or four big states rather than the 15 straight strategy that he employed against Clinton. Think about that. He had a 15 state strategy. So that means that only 30% of the states were part of the strategy to win. That's all you really need. Now, if you hadn't had the Electoral College, he would have gone to four states, only 8% of the states. We have to understand what a problem that would be. Now, the Rolling Stone magazine says that uh, the problem with the Electoral College is that it rigged the election for Donald Trump. No, he played by the system, and now they're trying to move the goalpost. But it is a good system. The founders created the system for two reasons. Number one, it was the states that created the federal government, not the other way around. And they were seen as equals to the federal government and as checks to the federal government. But when I talked about it being a firewall, you have to understand that if we allow only three or four large states to determine the presidency, then you're going to have cities like New York and Illinois and LA where you have rampant voter fraud as well as election fraud. They will pad the totals in those popular states. Just in New York State alone, uh, New York City alone, you have nearly the amount of people that you have in North Carolina statewide. You have like three or four times what you have in South Carolina, for example. So we will basically have just a couple of large cities that will determine the election for the rest of us. And when you go back and look at the structure of this, understand 
that just as we had sovereign nations unfortunately create the United Nations, and we are not yet subject to a hierarchical situation where the United Nations is dictating it to us as the federal government does. The people who were pushing against the federal government getting more power, the anti-federalists, were very concerned that what we would have is a pyramid structure with the federal government at the top, a consolidation, a concentration of power at that central area. If we were to have that, for example, with the UN, and if we were to move from a system where we have individual countries or states having their own individual votes to a system where we had a worldwide democratic election, what would happen? We would have China and India deciding everything for us. And we would have to rely on the Chinese government to honestly report those vote totals to us. See, that's the problem with, with doing away with the Electoral College. But that is a big part of the strategic push right now. We see uh, publications, mainstream media, just railing about the Electoral College as we see Hillary Clinton's vote totals continue to climb and climb and climb. It was even reported in the Daily Mail. Well, her vote totals now are currently over 2 million. We'll give her another week and they'll add another million to it. And that is coming from Democratic strongholds. That is why we have the Electoral College as a firewall against that kind of corruption and concentration of power. Meanwhile, we have uh, George Soros, as we see as Hillary Clinton getting involved and the idea that they're going to have a recount in Wisconsin. She said, yeah, we're going to join in this over the weekend. Let's take a look, as Breitbart does, uh, back at George Soros's financed lawyer, Mark Elias, who uh, was working with Hillary Clinton. As they point out, the lawyer representing Hillary Clinton's recount efforts recently led legal battles against state voting laws with an infusion of funding from billionaire George Soros, the usual suspects. And they point out that what he is doing is funding lawsuits in places like North Carolina, which prevent North Carolina from actually looking at photo ID of people. There is nothing racist about looking at photo ID. If there is, then we need to shut down the TSA. We need to shut down all the different uh, grocery stores and retailers who ask to see your photo ID when you cash a check. Now, we're not allowed to do that because that's racist. We need to understand as we see in North Carolina, the push is always in a few corrupt jurisdictions within the state. For example, in North Carolina, it was in Durham, where they extended the voting hours by an hour and a half and said, we're going to extend this. And, and you have to understand that in North Carolina, you can show up if you simply have a name and an address and you're allowed to vote because there's no photo ID. So these types of things that they call restrictive Voting laws. No, they're not restrictive voting laws if you look at somebody's ID. Meanwhile, we have Jill Stein saying that we need to uh, shut down, we need to audit these uh, voting machines. And she actually said, we don't have any proof. We don't have any smoking gun. We just think that that may have happened. And for that purpose, she is willing, and for her own self aggrandizement, she is willing to throw the entire process into chaos. I have to say that in this election cycle, what I have seen from both the Libertarian Party and from the Green Party is, uh, is really something that sets back the whole idea of a multi-party democracy. I, for one, have worked for a long time, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, with the Libertarian Party, trying to get multi-party democracy. I don't like the duopoly of the Republican and the Democratic Party. I would like for us to be able to have other parties that have access to the ballot in a fair way, have access to the debates in a fair way. And yet we have seen from both of these parties, the Libertarian Party and now from the uh, Green Party, we've seen that they have essentially become whatever uh, people have been accusing them of, and that is a distraction and a hindrance to moving this along. They're not using uh, their access in a way that is responsible. You know, Jill Stein was right back in June when she said Hillary Clinton was a criminal. But at this point, what we need to do is we need to focus on the criminal organization that she's created, the Clinton Foundation. Because like the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, these foundations that are endowed by, with billions of dollars by these billionaires are going to continue a life of their own. And just as we see with George Soros' Open Society Foundation, the Hillary Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, is going to continue to steal money from people, but it's also going to continue to overthrow governments, including our own, if we don't stop it. It's going to be a perpetual instrument of these uh, people. Today, we see that the uh, Trump administration is going to pressure foreign governments to probe the Clinton Foundation. 
A source close to President-elect Donald Trump's transition team told the Post, the New York Post, that the new administration plans to pressure U.S. ambassadors that it will name to bring up the foundation with foreign governments and suggest that they probe its financial dealings. The source said Haiti and Colombia will be key diplomatic posts for this because of all the money involved. And we've talked at length about how the Clinton Foundation raped Haiti. We've done long reports about that. We've talked to people from Haiti to show that. But look at this from other states. We've had, as I point out, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Netherlands, Canada, Sweden, Ireland. All of them have given millions, they say. Well, I would say it's more like tens or more likely hundreds of millions of dollars in the aggregate to the Clintons. They say days after Hillary Clinton's election defeat, the French federal comptrollers began following a trail of tens of millions in government money that ended up in the Clinton Foundation coffers. The Australian government last week announced it would end its decade-long affiliation with the Clinton Foundation. Norway is also scaling back. See, they don't have any influence to sell. These people are on the short end of the stick. They've been selling favors, and now they've got nothing to deliver. But also we see that in China, the globalists are now looking to the Chinese to defend globalism. Isn't that interesting? As we see from this article from the LA Times, they point out uh, China's government oversaw the worst crackdown on dissent in nearly three decades. The Chinese built and militarized islands and disputed waters off the South China Sea. They tightened controls over the Internet. They froze out foreign firms while allowing their domestic competitors to prosper. See, that is true nationalism. That is hyper-nationalism. And it is everything that the left, that all these globalists say that they're in favor of. They all tell us that they're in favor of a free Internet. They tell us that they're in favor of free trade, and yet China is the antithesis to that. However, they are the tool of the multinational corporations and the globalists. And now they turn to China to try to strategize against Trump. Now, when we come back, we're going to look at someone else that they're turning to besides China, and that is David Petraeus. A very dangerous meeting happened today. Hopefully, we can get Donald Trump's ear. You need to get his ear on social media and tell him, never pick David Petraeus. And we'll tell you why after we come back from the break. Today, Donald Trump met with former General David Petraeus and also former head of the CIA who left in disgrace. For many of the same issues, the people were calling for the incarceration of Hillary Clinton. David Petraeus also dodged the bullet, not to the extent that Hillary Clinton did. No, he got charged with a misdemeanor. And actually, he is under probation for a couple of years. So it brings up an interesting point if Donald Trump were to pick him. And of course, the reason this has surfaced is because we've seen back and forth two camps within the uh, Trump transition team. Uh, the two names that have been put forward prior to this were uh, Rudy Giuliani and Mitt Romney. And, of course, there has been a massive pushback against Mitt Romney by the people who elected Donald Trump. Is Petraeus better? We see, as it's reported today from Bloomberg, President-elect Donald Trump met with retired General David Petraeus Monday as a senior official with the transition team said the former CIA director is being considered for Secretary of State amid open infighting among Trump's advisors about who to pick for the post. And then Trump tweeted out, just met with General Petraeus, was very impressed. Yes, you should be very impressed with David, with General Petraeus, and you should be unfavorably impressed. And we're going to tell you why, but go on to say that uh, Petraeus, a four-star general, I would say actually he's a suck-up opportunist. He is a globalist leader, and we'll tell you about that. He left government under a cloud for sharing classified documents during an extramarital affair. He told reporters, however, that Trump showed a great grasp of a variety of challenges that are out there and some of the opportunities as well. So a very good conversation, and we'll see where it goes from here. This guy is the Grimer worm tongue for the globalists. He is the new Kissinger, the new Brzezinski. We should avoid him like the plague. And like, I have to say that if Donald Trump picks David Petraeus, either wittingly or unwittingly, you're not going to see Americanism. You're going to see globalism. And we'll tell you exactly why. When I say General Petraeus is a committed globalist, remember back in February of 2015 when he made the very interesting statement, writing in an op-ed piece for the Washington Post, Petraeus said, together with Canada and Mexico, the U.S. has a competitive advantage in geopolitics. He said the 20th century was the American century, the 21st, is poised to be the North American century. Many of us understood at the time what he was talking about was NAFTA and the North American Union. This guy is a committed globalist. He is at the center of the Bilderberg Group. He is a Wall Street crony capitalist with uh, KKR. He has supported 
foreign interventionist wars, the total surveillance state bragging about how the Internet of Things is going to spy on you when he was a CIA director. He is a gun control advocate. Over and over again, we see that uh, General Petraeus is someone I believe will betray us. And as he goes on, he talks about how climate change is a national security threat. And this was repeated by U.S. News saying global warming poses one of the greatest dangers to the U.S. and its allies long before John Kerry was saying that climate change was an equal or greater threat than ISIS. David Petraeus was saying this. So if you think we're going to stop the climate change madness, if you think we're going to stop the climate change treaties that are key to globalism, think again. As a matter of fact, why not just keep John Kerry? Because he's the one that thinks that uh, climate change, global warming, is equivalent to ISIS. Just keep him there. We don't need to move him out of the office. He already knows where the car is and the keys to the office. Meanwhile, we see that not only did uh, Petraeus meet and support Clinton during the campaign, but we saw about a month and a half ago that there were 1,000 of the 30,000 missing Clinton emails were between her and General Petraeus. Now, when he was head of CENTCOM back in 2009, Hillary Clinton sent him messages saying, just email me these uh, documents on my private server. She said, uh, if there's ever anything you need or want me to know, please use this personal address. All the best, Hillary. And as he was head of CENTCOM, he sent about a thousand emails that we can see on the log of CENTCOM, but they're not in the Hillary Clinton list. So it looks like David Petraeus is equivalent to Hillary Clinton. We might as well have put Hillary Clinton in as Secretary of State as Barack Obama did, or just keep John Kerry there so he can promote climate change. Either way, David Petraeus is going to be running the opposite direction of Donald Trump and Donald Trump's voters if he is Secretary of State, and that's a key thing. He's going to fight Donald Trump on the treaties. He's going to fight him on the war issues. Forgive me. I have scanned. The government wants you to view them as God. To do that, they attempt to reproduce the very attributes of God. God, Verment, wants you to see it as omniscient, knowing everything about you. Omnipresent, its constant presence on the media, cameras watching you everywhere, on your phone, on your computer. And as omnipotent, presenting itself as all-powerful and irresistible. This is why the police are becoming increasingly brutal and publicly getting away with it. This is the fog for what I would like in the specter of these global corporations to just take over. Yeah, that's right. And it, what it really does is it gives them all that power, having all that knowledge. Then they now know how or who they have to deal with in their, in their societies to be able to, to control the outcomes. That's really what, what, what I've been saying for several years is that their whole idea is population control. And in order to do that, you have to have knowledge about the population, and that's what this is giving them. A security clearance to even be able to function and have a job, even in the private sector. I mean, this is beyond Hitler's best dreams, isn't it, sir? Oh, it's well beyond all, uh, Orwell's in 1984, too. I mean, it's just uh, it's just total, it's, it's getting into not only the things that you're doing and who you're working with and who you do those things with, but also what you're thinking. And that's really, uh, that's really where this is heading. And then openly blackmailing you to submit and do everything you're told, <laughs> or they will lower your social score so you can't operate in society and can't travel. Yeah, and if they, if they can't get to you, they'll get to somebody you care about, just like the KGB did. On December 1st, 2016, the spy state will slip a Fourth Amendment violating procedure into the federal rules of criminal procedure. Notice the term procedure. According to an article released by the Electronic Frontier Foundation back in April, the amendment to Rule 41 isn't procedural at all. It creates new avenues for government hacking that were never approved by Congress. Congress. The proposal would grant a judge the ability to issue a warrant to remotely access, search, seize, or copy data when the district where the media or information is located has been concealed through technological means, or when the media are on protected computers that have been damaged without authorization and are located in five or more districts. It would grant this authority to any judge in any district where activities related to the crime may have occurred. The first 
part of this change would grant authority to practically any judge to issue a search warrant to remotely access, seize, or copy data relevant to a crime when a computer was using privacy protective tools to safeguard one's location. All of those using a VPN service or even those denying GPS location of their devices through a map app, for example, are subject to being implicated by the little known procedural amendment. And while the federal hackers are hacking your device or computer with malware, malicious hackers with far better experience hacking botnet devices will be hacking the federal government, causing any and all of your private data to be exposed simply because you were exercising your right to privacy, which is apparently a crime now. And all of it done with zero public debate. Two and a half weeks ago, it was discovered that there were 17 cell, uh, cell towers in the, the southwest, the southeast actually, that um, were fake cell towers. Uh, they were, uh, rather than transmitting phone calls directly to who you were talking to, they were planting software on the devices that you were using to connect. Well, you don't have to actually put a cell tower beside the road or on top of a mountain. You can put it in the back of your car and put an antenna on the top of your car and be anywhere. And they look and sound exactly like real cell towers. These devices are manufactured by the Harris Corporation. They're the only company that manufactures them. And they have a contract with all of their customers saying that the customer cannot talk about where they bought the equipment from or the fact that they own this equipment. Google was founded by the CIA and NSA on record 14 years ago. Uh, Apple uh, is really a CIA front. Microsoft is pre-CIA. It's an IBM front that actually created the CIA. You might want to look into that. Uh, who set up IBM, what its goal was. World domination, uh, master race, uh, eugenics. Uh, IBM was probably the main funder of Hitler. If you're a new listener, that sounds crazy. Just, just please look it up. Okay. John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, it has not been the best season for Colin Kaepernick. Perhaps not the most memorable or the most memorable, depends on how he wants to look at it. But once again, he has opened his mouth to the chagrin of many NFL fans. Now, when Colin Kaepernick took the field on Sunday to play Miami, he was met with thousands of boos after he praised Fidel Castro hours before his death and even wore a shirt adorned with the Cuban dictator's face. So once again, Colin Kaepernick having to make political statements on the sports platform, something that I'll comment on here in a little bit, but for him, I think it has turned out negatively. Now, Kiko Alonso has been said to turn his bad blood for Colin Kaepernick into a great performance. Now, Kiko Alonso is the second generation um, American from his uh, Cuban exiled father. And it was Kiko Alonso who says that Colin Kaepernick, uh, his mouth essentially motivated Alonso to put in a great performance. So Kaepernick's mouth cost him again. Kiko Alonso delivered the game-winning tackle on Colin, on Colin Kaepernick on Sunday. And then after he made the tackle, he adorned a Cuban flag on a headband and met with his Cuban exile father and other family members to enjoy his productive day, Alonzo went on and talked about how he had strong feelings about what Kaepernick said, and he carried those feelings into the game. It makes me wonder if there were other players who shared similar feelings that they also brought into the game when they played Colin Kaepernick. I know myself, if I was in that uh, circumstance, I might have a little bit of added aggression towards the uh, quarterback, if you will. And then Kiko uh, also chimed in saying that Colin Kaepernick, he's ignorant. And I think that that's exactly what it is. And here's the thing about, me, about this for me. I actually support what Colin Kaepernick is doing here. He's trying to ingest real issues using his platform of sports media. I guess my issue is just how he's done it. I don't think that the protest of the national anthem was the greatest thing. I don't think He's very well educated on some of the things that he's protesting. Nonetheless, we are starting to get this 
conversation going and this rhetoric started amongst these athletes, Kiko Colonzo chimes in and stands up for the people of Cuba who were mistreated by Fidel Castro, which Colin Kaepernick uh, went on to ignorantly praise. Now, more on Colin Kaepernick. Again, he loses this Sunday. The player who makes the game-winning tackle says that he had extra motivation. Actually, he said in this story he wanted to hit Colin Kaepernick because of the comments he made about Fidel Castro. Uh, but it gets worse for Colin Kaepernick. That loss on Sunday is a record. The 49ers set franchise record for consecutive losses. Ten straight losses for the Niners this year. That is a record in their 70 years of existence. Never have they lost 10 straight games. Do you think that that might be a little bit of karma there for Colin Kaepernick and the Niners? I would also guess that in 70 years of the 49ers' existence as a franchise, they have never had anybody protest the national anthem. So I'm just saying that's another coincidence. The strange thing about this that I recall Players used to cry during the national anthem. I remember then the cameraman used to flash on the sideline and there would be streams rolling down the player's face because they knew how blessed they were to be in this country. They knew that the opportunity to be a professional football player or any athlete um, really probably only existed for them or the best opportunities in this country. It's funny how far we've came from a, a country who would cry during the national anthem to now a football player who wants to cry and then protest the national anthem. But this is costing the NFL in the ratings, and they are now considering canceling Thursday night football. So protests by the NFL players against the country on the rise, and what do you know, the ratings go down. And, of course, to me, if we could get Americans to have the same passion for freedom, for their country, for truth, and for justice as they do for their favorite NFL football team, we could turn this country around like that. This is Owen Troyer for InfoWars.com. If you control the media, if you control the Justice Department, if you control the Police, you own the system. Why does Pizzagate matter? Key elements include the ownership of Vesta Pizza, located two doors down from Comet Ping Pong Pizza. Vesta Pizza is owned by Andrew Klein, a lawyer with the DOJ's Human Trafficking Unit. This symbol, which has since been removed, is the exact symbol representing boy love that the FBI flagged in their investigation of public displays of pedophilia code. It's pretty simple. One of the leading prosecutors dealing exclusively with child trafficking decided to overtly display it on the menu of a business he owns. Coincidence? A case of bad luck regarding artistic license? Or is the red fox running the hen house? Another key element. Just three doors down from Besta Pizza is the Politics and Prose bookstore where many prominent politicians, including Barack Obama, have spoken. The bookstore is owned by Washington Post journalist Bradley Graham and his wife Lisa Muscatine. Muscatine served as chief speechwriter and top advisor to Hillary Clinton. Directly across the street from Prose and Poetry is the Beyond Borders office. Beyond Borders claims it is fighting to end child slavery in Haiti. This, after angry Haitians have demanded the billions of aid the Clinton Foundation stole from them. However, New Life Children's Refuge founder Laura Silsby, a woman with financial hellhounds on her trail due to her failing internet business personal shopper, which was rife with charges of unpaid employees, fraud, and wrongful termination suits, attempted to traffic 33 Haitian children into the Dominican Republic in the aftermath of the Haitian earthquake on January 12, 2010. Haitian officials placed Silsby and nine other missionaries under arrest for child trafficking. After all were released except for Silsby, Silsby's attorney withdrew as her counsel. Silsby then hired Jorge Pueyo, 
a Dominican attorney under investigation for child trafficking in El Salvador. It was then that Hillary and Bill Clinton stepped in to diminish the charges against Silsby. According to WikiLeaks, Hillary's interest in Silsby dated back nine years before the Haitian earthquake. WikiLeaks also reveals that Huma Abedin kept Hillary in the loop regarding Silsby's situation. Shania King, writing for the Harvard Human Rights Journal, elaborates, the Haitian justice system, prodded in part by President Clinton's diplomatic efforts on behalf of the missionaries, determined that none of the missionaries were guilty of illegal activities except the leader, Laura Silsby, who faced a lesser charge of organizing illegal travel. Along with the Haitian justice system, some observers excused the missionaries' actions, even though they rose to the level of child trafficking. They did so essentially because we place such little value on the integrity of poor families. Another disturbing Pizzagate element. James Alifantis has also visited the White House five times, which adds to the perverse nature of this WikiLeaks email regarding President Obama when the pedo code is applied to hot dog slash pizza. It reads, I think Obama spent $65,000 of the taxpayers' money flying in pizza slash dogs from Chicago for a private party at the White House not long ago. Assume we are using the same channels? I still go back to the same thing I've said from the beginning. A poor pedophile must go out and take the risk of being caught by grabbing their own victim. Does the rich pedophile take that risk of being caught? Heavens no. They pay someone. That's when we develop supply and demand. It now has the name of human trafficking, and it's going on everywhere in the United States. Say what you want about the filth on Comet Ping Pong pizza owner James Alifantis' Instagram. The most damaging pictures are those of digging holes in the floor in what appears to be an attempt to connect Comet Ping Pong to the exclusive underground labyrinth of Washington, D.C. Tie all of that into Alifantis' ranking as GQ's 49th most powerful man in D.C. and politics and pros owners Graham and Muscatine as numbers 50, Alifantis and company and the circumstantial evidence far outweighs even the Michael Jackson pedo scandal. Maybe that's why Macaulay Culkin named his band Pizza Underground. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for InfoWars.com. We're bringing you more information regarding the Ohio State shooting that happened on that campus today. What we're learning about this, I'm joined in studio by gun expert, resident reporter Joe Biggs. We're going to be talking about how the fact, Joe, nobody on that campus was allowed to carry a gun despite Ohio having pretty lax concealed carry state laws. You are allowed to carry in the state. Um, giving them some more information about what happened on the campus today, there was an unidentified 18-year-old Somalian refugee who rammed his car into a group of students, pulled out a butcher knife, began slicing, injured nine people. How do you think this would have been different you know, had students been armed, had students been aware of their rights to be armed, and do you think the school has any sort of, I don't want to implicate them, but, you know, not allowing students to be able to defend themselves is one thing. Could this have gone differently, do you think? Well, when you have someone driving a car into a crowd, there's not much you can do to stop that. Now, once the man jumped out and decided to start chopping people up with a machete, mm -hmm. at that point in time, you know, if you weren't hit by a car, if someone had their concealed carry, they'd be able to reach down for a sweet little Springfield 1911 EMP4 <laughs> and put two to the chest, one in the head, and that bad guy pretty quick, right. and you know you'd be done. Instead, this guy was able to uh, continue on this rampage, so to say, and start hacking up people uh, after he ran into people. So uh, there's not much you can do essentially with a guy just deciding to run up on a sidewalk and hit people, mm -hmm. you know. But we've seen in the past Al Qaeda, ISIS. They called for these kind of attacks to run people over, to jump out and use machetes and things Whatever like that. Whatever weapon you have. Whatever you have, you know. And <clears throat> bad guys know the laws. Any kind of criminal knows the laws of those areas very well, and they use that uh, uh, to help them out. You know, you, you, you look at these, the history of these attacks. They always happen in gun-free zones. Gun-free zones, what I've always said, are kill zones. Do you think he knew that this was a gun-free zone? Like he was a well, he, he, he was a guy who lived there right down the road, so I'm, I'm sure he's very aware of what's going on. I mean, you're, you're not just going to blindly go into a lot of these situations without um, 
looking at the laws and kind of finding out, you know, how quickly, you know, there's going to be a response. You know, I, I think this guy probably did his homework and uh, he knew that there was going to be a good chance that he could kind of get away with what he was going to do uh, before police showed up and someone with a gun was able to uh, initially, uh, you know, stop him or take him down. Uh, but there were multiple people, you know, they were in on this. I know two guys were taken away and handcuffed as well. They were in well. the car yeah. with, the, with a suspect who was ch trying to chop people up. The, the initial report was that he had a machete. Turns out it was a butcher knife. And uh, we could get into an immigration discussion here and properly vetting refugees. That's a different topic for a different day. But, you know, what's happening on these campuses, I myself, you know, prior to joining InfoWars, had never really had a lot of, and being from Kentucky, I'd never had a lot of experience around weaponry like this. And we're really encouraged as women to sort of become comfortable with the right to protect yourself. And, you know, I know, I know that you've talked to students on campus, you've interviewed people. Do you find like they're compliant? They, they oftentimes don't even know which way is up. I mean, the, the sad thing is, is I, I was looking on social media and there were different kids in these uh, classrooms who were throwing up chairs to block this door down. And I'm like, you know, depending on the size of this guy, someone can run in there, hit that door. I mean, some, some little chairs that students use aren't going to do it. It's pretty sad and pathetic when you have to go to that. You know, you should be able to have a gun. You should be able to protect yourself when some loony like that decides to come in and attack you, you know, because when seconds count, police are minutes away. And that's in the, you know, the difference between life and death. And that's the important thing people have to understand. No one really quite understands that and what that means until they're put in one of those situations themselves and they survive it. I guarantee you Ohio State and those students are going to reevaluate uh, campus carry and, and look at these uh, abilities to be able to protect yourself. I guarantee you a lot of these students are going to go out and take those concealed weapons uh, courses. They're going to go out, get firearms, and try to find a, a way to better uh, uh, improve themselves and to be able to protect themselves. Do you have any advice for specifically women? Because women, we're not taught that, you know, even to defend ourselves, you know, that you have really have to come out of a brainwashing where you have the right to defend yourself against an attack like this if somebody is attacking you. Any advice? We've got 30 seconds left just for people that might be listening to this, where to start, where to begin, if they want to, you know, become more educated about their right to bear arms in this country. Well, first and foremost, go to InfoWars.com and you can yeah. watch our videos uh, because most of us here are, uh, you know, uh, gun, uh, I wouldn't say experts, but we definitely follow the Second Amendment. We definitely know our rights. Uh, find your local gun store, take a concealed weapons permit uh, course, uh, get your license, go through those steps and uh, improve your knowledge. And you yourself could uh, be able to uh, save people around you and protect yourself, your property and your family. All right, so tell me some other things. Uh, that's a good, you know, warm-up for people. What else could they do if they really wanted to get started in defending themselves? First and foremost, watch our show because we cover a lot of gun uh, issues and topics here at InfoWars.com. Uh, we have people on like Tim Kennedy, myself, and others who uh, work with weapons quite a bit. Uh, I'm ex-military. Tim Kennedy is still uh, operational in Special Forces and uh, is out there training all the time as well. The best thing to do is if you're going to have a gun and you, you make this choice, that you yourself want to carry something like this, a concealed gun. This is a Springfield EMP4 1911. It's small, it's compact, it's easy to carry. You need to practice how you would be in everyday life. You need to find something that's going to be comfortable for you as a woman, how you can conceal carry. Now, there's different types of garments you can get. There's an inside uh, waistband that goes in between your legs. You can pull up a skirt, right? and then you can pull a gun. There's, there's different bra holsters. There's right. all kinds of different things that you as an individual need to find out that's comfortable for you and how you go about your everyday. What side do you carry your purse on? Things like that. Everybody, every individual has to think about and break down if you want to be uh, su uh, sufficient uh, in the fight back against uh, an attack like this. So it's not just as simple as going out and buying a gun and going to an indoor range and putting some uh, rounds down range because that, at the end of the day, you're just wasting money. You're not really doing anything. It's just like a muscle. You need to use it all the time to build that up and get that muscle memory. So that's what a firearm, this, is a, this firearm is an extension of your body. It needs to be a part of you. You need to know mentally where that gun is. If something happens, say there's a shooting or some jackass decides to pull out a machete, you need to already know where that gun is without even looking for it, grabbing it and instinctively going in for that shot. Now, if you're going to be someone who carries it in your purse, you need to have that purse beside you a lot somewhere within arm's reach that you know where it is. A lot of people go out and buy guns, and they forget about all these other things that you have to go into it. It's a responsibility. It's just like having anything else in your life that you want to be good at. You've got to practice, practice, practice. 
You know, there's a lot of people that go to the range once a month. That's not enough. Um, you can take concealed uh, carry classes where you can go in and get your license and be able to carry this on your person, depending on state laws and regulations or the campus you're at. You know, Texas, we have a campus carry, but you need to find out those laws, and then you need to learn those laws, just like you would the Constitution. You need to eat, sleep, and breathe that and understand what it is you're able to do. Um, the biggest thing to do is you can take self-defense courses, learn how to use stuff other than just guns, learn how to use knives, uh, you know, choke points, holds, all these different things that can be done uh, if you don't have that ability to get to it. The second of all is understanding your surroundings. You know, what kind of a classroom environment, say we're a student, what kind of classroom environment am I, am I in on a daily basis? A lot of people are so complacent. They go, they sit down, they go there every day, they go through this same process every day. They, uh, we're taught to do that, though, Joe. We're taught to be dumbed down, compliant. We yeah. don't ever question anything. Keep your head down. Do what you're told. That's how you really have to let go of that in a lot of uh, a lot of the time because if you don't let go of that, you go through life like that. I mean, that's kind of how we're taught from the time we're born. When I go into a, a new room, a new setting, a restaurant, whatever it may be, I sit down. I'm counting exits, entrances, uh, what can be used as a weapon if I can't have a gun on me in that instance because of the the signage that's outside saying I can't conceal carry. Um, I'm looking for things I can use. I'm finding possible routes in and out the back or the front where I can go, what looks like a sturdy foundation that I could hide behind if someone does start firing rounds at me. You need to always be thinking like that all the time, wherever you go, because how many people go into these situations? How many people went to school today at Ohio State and thought that something was going to happen? None of them. No, no one expects that. But you as an individual can take the steps necessary to take these preventative measures and think about that every day, make it a routine, make it a habit. Think about this every time you go into a new room, because if you're going to be in this room every day, you should know it better than some jackass who just showed up, who doesn't know that room better than you. You better know what could be used, broken off as a stick to use as a weapon. What could be used to jam that door that's going to be sufficient to use uh, to stop that. This is something that you need to do as a human being to survive, because we live in a world right now Quite frankly, the borders are wide, you know, open, they are. and they're allowing these people come really in. Quickly, we're running out of time. His name was Abdul Artin. That's what we're finding out about him. 19 years old. Excuse me, I said 18 earlier. It says it says here it's 19. He's 19 years old, um, Somali immigrant. We can expect to see more of these. It's up to you to to take care of yourself, to take care of your family, and frankly, be able to defend yourself. That's going to do it for us for tonight. Be sure check out our website infowars.com for more reports like this. I'm Margaret Howell with Joe Biggs.